Now, an opportunity to add some competitive adrenaline to your radio activity and learn some new operating skills, courtesy of Olaf Lundberg, G0CKV. And don't forget to post your questions for Olaf on the YouTube chat. We'll try to get to them if there's time at the end. And don't forget your call sign. So, Olaf, hello and over to you. Seek a contest. Hello out there in cyberspace. There are so many ways to enjoy our ham radio hobby. Just look at the various uh, presentations during this year's virtual RSGB conference. Now, I'm going to talk about HF contesting, which is my favorite flavor if I have to choose just one. I uh, will talk about preparations before the contest, uh, about the contest in full swing and what we should do after the contest. And I will also talk about how I got interested in contesting. And with all that, we also have propagation and tennis and a little bit of a little bit about equipment and uh, odds and ends to talk about. However, before we get carried away, remember that your best antenna, your best rig, your best location is what you have right there and now. So when this convention is over in the afternoon, why not switch on your rig, jump straight in and hand out some points in the uh, Scandinavian SSB activity contest, which should be in full swing, provided, of course, you watch this in real time. Also, an, a quick administrative note, I may go fast now and then, but don't worry, there will be links. There will be a link to links. So links are coming. I have so many times been asked by friends about this radio contesting thing I'm doing, and I have not found it easy to explain. We uh, certainly don't do it for money, do we? To impress our girlfriends and spouses? Well, I suspect that they are generally probably not all that impressed. Is it a spectator sport? No, not really. Do we get any headlines in Financial Times? Well, I haven't seen any, so I had to make up a fake one myself. Not even in Daily Fail, as far as I'm concerned. Radio conditions forecasted in BBC? No, not normally. Any knighthood for contesters? Not that I'm aware of it, at least. Uh, so why do we do it? It must be something deeper, probably personal, different for each one of us. For me, the kick you get out of the competitive adrenaline is one factor. And the aggregation of skills you need to do well, the operating speed, accuracy, technology, propagation, the self-improvement, the learning, the doing better every time thing. Maybe it is the opportunity to test your perseverance. Experiencing cool, surprising band openings, busting pile-ups, running pile-ups at a high rate, perhaps. Well, let me tell you how I got hooked. Or my journey, as they say nowadays. I grew up in Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast. It was a very lively port, and the port was a prime area for play and adventure for schoolboys. Two steamships, Suecia and Britannia, sailed between Gothenburg and Tilbury in London. They loaded cars differently in those days. This naive attempt to do art in school features a ship with several prominent antennas. A dark, stormy Sunday evening in November 1954, I listened to the distress traffic on 2182 kHz as a local fishing vessel, Golf Golf 184 Excide, went under. I still remember the drama as if it was yesterday. On that Monday after school, I went to the local library and borrowed books about ships and radio, and I read about Titanic. Communications failure in many dimensions. I tried to build radios on my kitchen table. If it's true that you learn by mistake, I learned a lot. My wife thought it was hilarious when she found a French school book that I had enhanced with hypothetical radio designs. I couldn't afford to buy an R1155, so I bought an R208 for the money I had earned during my first summer job. That was fortuitous because while the R1155 could only listen up to 18 MHz, the R208 could tune 10 to 60 MHz. Then in early October 1957, the first Sputnik was launched. With my R208, I could listen to Sputnik on 20 and 40 MHz. That was as exciting as it comes. As boys, we then started to build rockets. One of our mates blew off his thumb, so we quickly learned that it was safe to listen to satellites rather than to try to launch them. 
around 1958 solar cycle 19 had its peak and what a peak that was maybe the best ever recorded 20 meter was open 24 hours you could hear and work the world easily on 15 and 10 with uh, simple gear I listened to the guys at the club station at the local technology university running stations worldwide at the quick pace in some contest. Wow, that sounded like fun. I was hooked. I wanted to do that. And a few years later, I was the chairman of the club and uh, we did contests whenever studies permitted. And um, to be honest, also when studies did not permit. Then with the growing family, work and travel, amateur radio was put on the back burner for many, many years. So let's talk about fairness in HF contesting. WRTC, the World Radio Team Championship, that's as fair as they come. There are some 60 stations that are more or less in the same location. Same power, same antenna, and overlooked in the tent by a referee. More generally, we have uh, stations that are built on a hilltop, on the beach, or in a valley. North, south, east, west could be in a double multiplier location or we could be or it could be a G or DL in a three point or a one point location could be a rural quiet or city suburban we could use towers with stacked beams or wet strings a station that is uh, that cost a fortune to build or it could be a station that is more average than most so we can't really say that contesting is fair in the Formula One sense. But so what? The main thing is that it's fun when we do it. The uh, most annoying unfairness of all, as far as I'm concerned, is that some of those guys out there, they work harder at it than I do. They build better stations than I do. And on top of that, they are also better operator than I am. Not fair. Let's uh, talk about different contesting styles. You have the super stations, high power, big antennas. You have the DX locations. You have the suburban London, low power, wet string type location. And of course you have QRP. It is great fun to operate from a super station. You are loud, you hold your frequency. You expect to be heard immediately. You run, 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 and many multipliers come to you. It's even more fun, I would say, to operate as a DX station. Even more people chase you. You are the multiplier. Operating from a suburban location with the wet strings can be more of a challenge. It's very satisfying when you do well. You take nothing for granted. You can search and pounce at a higher rate than run, perhaps. It is certainly a waste of time to fight for your frequency. You begin to learn real contesting skills the hard way. And then, of course, we have QRP. That's where you save big on electricity. But you delegate the hard work to the station you call who has to dig you out from the noise. Let us get back to the sun and to propagation. For billions of years the visible and infrared radiation from the sun has remained extraordinarily constant. And they say that the sun will continue like that, not forever, but for a very, very long time. Above infrared and visible light in frequency there is also ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet and X-ray radiation that is somewhat less constant. It is that radiation that gives us the ionosphere and our ionosphere changes with the illumination from the sun thus it changes over the 24-hour day the seasons and also with the 11-year sunspot cycles the sun also emits particles protons ions electrons in the solar wind and on top of that we have solar events like flares corona mass ejections and whatnot and down here on earth we also have the geomagnetic field. And whenever we have moving charges, we have an electric current that generates a magnetic field. And wherever we have an electric or a magnetic field, the electrons in those fields are affected. In all, a very complicated and ever-changing geophysical environment that makes shortwave propagation somewhat predictable, but also full of surprises. Since that uh, glorious sunspot maximum in 1958, we have learned so much more about the Sun-Earth interaction. Satellites outside the Earth's atmosphere are nowadays measuring solar radiation and mapping the Sun. They can detect solar eruptions, estimate solar wind, measure the radiation spectrum, the flux. And with the help of satellites, we can also map the total electron density in the ionosphere. Satellites have now mapped the sun, surf su sun surface for two full 11-year cycles. Yes. Scientists are now trying to forecast what the next cycle, 25, will look like. Their forecasts are all over the place. 
So I have, after much contemplation, come up with my own forecast. I bet my farm, of which I have got none, on being right on this forecast. Ionosons can tell us what the ionosphere looks like just above us just now. We have one such ionoson located just 10 kilometers south of Oxford at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Harwell. From this daytime diagram, we see that there are no reflections at all below 2 MHz because of the D-layer attenuation. The vertical reflections are only supported up to just below 6 MHz. Above that, we will get a skip zone. The approximate size of the skip zone can be read off the diagram at the bottom. 700 kilometers or so on 40, 1500 on 20. The ionosphere above Chiltern can reflect waves up to 18 megahertz, but then the elevation angle has to be very low. There's also ground wave communication, perhaps helpful in uh, local contest. Top band would give us the best coverage, and vertical antennas are much better than horizontal for ground wave. But it is, of course, the sky wave and the ionospheric propagation that we are most interested in. Frequencies above the critical frequency give us a uh, skip zone. The higher fre the frequency, the larger the skip zone. The higher the frequency, the lower the elevation angle has to be. More flux leads to more ionization, higher critical frequency, smaller skip zone, and better propagation with higher elevation angles. Note that the uh, hop length increases dramatically for lower elevation angles. Many long distance paths are multi hop, of course. When ionization is low, such as during sunspot minimum, and on the HF bands, bands may only be open for low elevation rays. And always when bands are open and close, it is those with good low elevation antenna patterns that can make the first contacts. Let's uh, look at European distances from the UK. Here's an example for UK and Scandinavia. For intra-UK contests, we need antennas with good high angle radiation pattern. To the points furthest away, we may need to get down to 10 to 20 degrees for a single hop connection. But generally, we can use very reasonable antennas. If you hang in there, I'll get to antennas very soon. For our local 8 meter contest, we can have some very interesting propagation in the evenings. The critical frequency can move down to 80 meters or below, and suddenly the band goes long. We get a skip zone on 80 and lose the intra-UK paths. You would have situations where some, on some UK paths, you can see, you can use perhaps frequencies down around 3.6 megahertz, while 3.8 is dead. Let's have a look at the recent Scandinavian activity contest on CW in September using the reverse beacon network spot analysis tool. We are looking at the spots recorded by the G4 Zulu Fox Echo skimmer, and we are looking at signals from Marty OH2BH MR, SE Sierra Echo 5 Echo, and Soren Oscar Zero, Zulu Z Zero Bravo. Uh, we note a few things. We note how 80 meters is not opening up until the delay goes away uh, at dusk. We note that on 80 and 40 meters, all three stations, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, are approximately of the same strength. And the band opens more or less at the same time. But let's look at 20 meters. There we see that Marty is uh, oh, much stronger, 20 dB or so stronger than uh, Ingemar in Sweden. We see that there are no spots at all from uh, Søren in Denmark. What is happening? Well, the skip zone is somewhere there, around 1000 miles perhaps. So we can hear Marty from Helsinki very well. We can hear Ingemar from the Stockholm area, sort of, but the Dane is much too close, he is in the skip zone. There are many tools available for propagation forecasting. My, fa my favorite tool is VOACAP Online. VOACAP Online is a very rich tool, there are many ways to use it. And here we are looking at the forecast for the path between UK and 3B8, 3B9 for um, November month of November. Each of these two clock charts show link re reliability per band and hour. See the circle is a 24-hour clock and the concentric circles are uh, the different bands from 80 up to or down to 10. 
we can associate a uh, one of these VOA cap forecasts with uh, different types of antennas, different antenna patterns. Here on the left, we are assuming a horizontal dipole at only 10 meters high. And on the right, we're assuming a quarter wave vertical on uh, average ground. Note how the horizontal dipole, even at that low height, is better than uh, the vertical on the HF bands. But note also that on the LF bands on 40 and 80, the vertical is better than the low dipole. And this would be even more true, of course, on 160. Here's another type of OA cap uh, online diagram. This is an area coverage. We are using an 80 meter dipole at 5 meters at 6 p.m. in October. If we go to a 10 meter antenna, we get a better pattern. 50 meter, even better. 20 meter, better. 40 meter, really good. We can also look at that 80 meter dipole again at 10 meters. We note how the distance covered, how the signal strength further away improves as we increase the height of the 80 meter dipole up towards uh, half wavelength above ground. Difficult to get an 80 meter dipole for the average citizen up to that height, but that's what it is. If we take the 80 meter dipole down to 10 meters again, we see that it's superb for it local coverage to Northern France, Netherlands and uh, the United Kingdom. If we instead used a vertical, we would still cover those areas and we would actually, but we wouldn't be so strong, but we would cover a wider area. We would be able to start to work DX on the vertical, which we couldn't do on the low dipo. Let's look at an area diagram. Now we are uh, for, for uh, the HF bands here. We are now assuming a sunspot number of 100. And uh, here's a uh, 20 meter dipole at 10 meter above ground in the morning on uh, 20. And you see the skip zone. You see the first hop, the second hop. If we instead look on 15 with the same parameters, we see the skip zone is bigger. Skipson goes out further away from us. If we look at uh, 15 meters here with sunspot number 100, and with uh, otherwise with with the same para and with the same parameters, except that we take the sunspot number down to zero, we get this miserable diagram. So we see that we really want to have those sunspots back for the HF bands. By the way. Let's look a little bit closer on 15 meters. We now have a 15 meter dipole that is five meters up above ground. Sunspot number is zero. And we see that uh, the area coverage here is pretty poor. If we increase the height of that dipole to 10 meters, it begins to look a little bit better. And if we increase it to 15 meters, it looks even better. Elevation angle is very important when the sunspot number is low and that means that we really should try to get the HF antennas up as high as possible. Another tool we can use to look at propagation is club log. It's a superb tool. Now this is very different because we're not talking about forecasts here. We're talking about real QSOs. We're talking about a database where actual QSOs have been logged over the years. So on the path between 3B8 and 3B9 to uh, zone 14, for instance, we can see here that the best time seems to be the two hours before midnight on both 80 and 160. During sunset and sunrise, propagation changes and the ionosphere is in a state of change. It's important to follow the gray line. Your best chance to work stations to the far east might be at their sunrise. And for us in the UK, our mornings are glorious paths to the west. On the Monday evening gray line All the signals five and nine But I don't Okay, so let's now spend a few minutes on antennas. Any antenna is better than no antenna, and more antennas are always better than few antennas. Buy a hilltop property with gentle slopes down to the ocean all around. Then get a few towers and begin to stop stack antennas. You will also need some acreage that can support receive eight circle antennas for the low bands. And buy some extra land to keep your neighbors away well, while you're at it. Well, I'll focus not on a dream station, but on simple fundamentals and the practical reality of the suburban real garden. 
Let's begin by talking about the value of a dB. While signals are S9++, even a QRP signal with moderate antenna would be strong. Here's another VOACAP chart for the path uh, UK to Morocco on 80 meters. We note that it looks like a fairly easy path and we have a 5S unit margin between the noise level at uh, S4 and the signal level at S9. And we can also see, by the way, how the path opens up fairly fast when uh, the delay disappears at uh, dusk. A DB more or less is not very relevant. But then let's look at the UK to uh, 3B8 path on 80 meters with the same parameters. Here the signal level is just at the noise level in the evening. Now every dB begins to count. We want a receive antenna that keeps the noise floor down and we want a transmit antenna where we don't lose unnecessary decibels. Let's uh, look a bit closer at uh, our 80 meter dipole. Here I'm using EasyNIC driven by an add-on called AutoEasy. We have a uh, simple 80 meter dipole and we are moving it between 5 and 40 meters height in 5 meter steps. You can see the height changing in the lower right corner. At 5 meters it's a pretty miserable antenna. But we see at 15 to 25 meters it makes a pretty decent in this uh, UK near Europe uh, antenna, not bad at all. Okay, here we look at uh, an 80 meter vertical and also on our 80 at our, our 80 meter dipole at 10 meter height. The dipole at 10 meter height is really an envious antenna. It's not very good for DX at all. The blue line here is what a uh, vertical on 80 meter could do in our in our rear garden with uh, above average ground. We see that elevation angles less than 20 degrees. The vertical is better. I would definitely put up a vertical rather than a low dipole for 80. Now, if we hypothetically go to the seawater, go to seawater, go to 3B8 to 3B9, we see that if we take that vertical and put it by the sea by seawater, it becomes phenomenal. Let's look at 20 meters. Here we have a 20 meter dipole again at 10 meters. It's the green line. That's a half wavelength on 20 meter. And we have our vertical, a 20 meter vertical, quarter wave vertical. That's a blue line. We see that that dipole at 10 meters height beats the vertical at all elevation angles. Except possibly, by the way, off the ends of the dipole, but maybe there too, I don't know. On the HF bands, I would definitely use a horizontal antenna in my rear garden, never a vertical, as long as I can get it up half a wavelength or more. So my suburban antenna farm is pretty straightforward. On HF, I will use horizontal antenna, trap dipole, inverted Vs, fan antennas, but horizontal is, is preferred for, uh, rather than vertical. On 40, probably touch and go between a vertical or dipole. If you can get the dipole quite high, the dipole would be good, otherwise use a vertical. On 160 and 80, I would definitely use a vertical. I would top load it if I could as a T or L. And I would try to use my trees to get the height up discreetly. Finally, now is the time to prepare, which is a great way to build up your anticipation of the fun to come. Good preparations is the mother of good luck, I am told. The first thing to do is to read the rules and then read them again. While you're at it, perhaps even print a copy of them to refer to them during the contest. Check categories, assisted, unassisted, power. Make sure you understand scoring and exchange. Why not set an objective for your entry? Win the world, a personal record, just have fun. Work 100 countries, 200 QSOs, to 1000 QSOs. Try to work more than 100 an hour, whatever you fancy, really. Most radios are frankly good enough nowadays for most of us. In a rare DX location where a big pileup may hit you, and also in a multi and some SO2R situation, the receiver's dynamic range and phase noise performance will make a difference. But for most of us, any radio is good enough nowadays. An STR on your IF output or on any receive antenna can be helpful if you want to up your game a bit. It will help you make a quick check for any 10 meter opening to make sure you are not too close to a big, ugly, clicky or splattering brute. To find a hole for your CQ, to check a pile up to position your second VFO, perhaps. I'm a miserable typist, so I need the help of a good keyboard. I like the mechanical keyboards that gamers use. 
They have this very satisfying clung, clung tactile feedback and illuminated keys. Then I label the keys used for CAN messages and keyboard macros. I much prefer a wired keyboard, wired mouse, headphones, no batteries, no Bluetooth or Wi Fi, or 433 MHz, no lost contacts in the middle of the contest. One of those impressively scary, highly organized types. Keep a logbook with notes about your antennas, cables, expected SWR, and whatever. It will serve you well over time. Now, I'm, I'm one of those who love complexity, but the simpler and more focused your station is, the better you will do. The contest is about making context as speed, the number of boxes, the number of knobs, the number of screens are not part of the score equation. To do really well, you need focus and not distractions. You may get a kick out of tweaking all those knobs. You have to watch all that stuff on the screens. If so, that's fine too, because we do want to have fun and enjoy what we are doing, don't we? Automation, simple QSY, switching band and antennas from your edit line in the logger, not only saves time, but makes the station more reliable, fail safe. It improves your agility. It avoids mistakes when you are tired, which can be very important. I would say that your antennas are much more important than your radio. But for many of us, loca our location will not allow big towers and big antennas. Try to get your horizontal antennas as high as possible. Use your trees. As long as you can get your 20, 15, 10 meter antenna up half a wavelength or so, a dipole would beat a vertical inland. On 160 and 8, an inverted L is likely to be your best bet. And a vertical might be better or equal to a dipole on 40, unless you get the dipole high enough. If you do use a 40 meter dipole, you can also use it on 15, and then you would have, could have a uh, 20, a fan dipole for 20 and 10. You will not win the world, but you can do well and you will have good fun. So we have a few minutes to go before the contest starts. Everything works, everything is well prepared, we are relaxed, like Mark, M0DXR and me before the WRTC in Boston a few years back. Your stock of healthy food within reach, your spare valves if you do QRO. Alexa, please wind up my towers. Hey, you stupid dumbwit, you have no towers, not even a single tiny one. Oh, nothing in the world can beat a weekend contest and no one in the world can beat us. Busy getting ready for the final conquest A lot of little plans to discuss Just an hour to go before we start the show And then it's 48 hours of hell Although it's hard to explain why we put up with this pain Well, we do it again and again We're gonna do it again So we are on, let me share some words of wisdom at a fast pace Put your ego aside, remember that this is fun. Convey a friendly sense of urgency, stay away from frequency fights. Work the dupes. On CW, maximize your RBN visibility. On CW, run fast, but moderately so. Be sensitive to skills at the other end. Avoid waste of time on repeats. Don't let your computer pretend that you're good at QRQ. Don't acknowledge jammers or other idiots at large. ID with your call sign every QSO, unless you are a DX and you're managing a big pile up. You don't own no frequency. You lose it when you take your afternoon nap. You also lose it when you return after a fumbling SO2R attempt. Courtesy in a contest is somewhat different from ordinary courtesy. You should be fast, be brief, no wasted words, no unnecessary repeats, no cute phonetics, and definitely, please, definitely never Please copy. A good communicator gets his message across. Slows down if necessary. Make sure your call and exchange has been copied correctly. Maybe you should lose the points if not. This shouldn't be controversial, but uh, not everyone agrees. Think accuracy. Double check cluster RBN call signs. Watch out for US zone state. Don't trust prefills. Listen. Always listen. Some phonetics can be difficult to get right. On CW, watch out for SH5, UV4 and DB6. Now where should you start when the contest starts? Maybe the highest band that is open. Low bands if they are about to close. High or low in the band? First hour, 
everyone is running. Maybe you should try S&P. Now, if you run at a good rate, just keep running. If rate is slow, maybe you should change something. Keep an eye on your contest math. If you have just been spotted on the DX cluster, stay put where you are. Use the band map if you do SMP. It gives you a very good mental picture of the band. Always enter calls in the band map when you listen the band. Don't miss easy multipliers. Maybe you should keep a list as a reminder. If you want to win the world, you have to run. But if you only run, you will miss many multipliers who only run. If you only do SMP, however, you will miss all those who only do SMP. You certainly should work the low bands at your sunrise. Watch the gray line. Workstations in the east at their sunrise. Use an SDR as a pan adapter. Is there any ES openings on 10? Is 20 open yet in the morning? Any activity on under 60 in the evening? Any unexpected late night opening on HF bands? The old way on CW in the old days. Use your elbows to grab a frequency low in the band and you sat there forever during the contest. The new way on CW. No need to suffer other people's elbows. You can be agile, QSY. RBN will find you. That's definitely more fun and also more democratic. Be aware of regional band, pl pl band plans. US Advanced and General, for instance, are not allowed to operate at the bottom of the band. On CW, tune just slightly off frequency to avoid this syndrome where everyone is just clicking and end up on exactly the same frequency making it impossible for the DX to copy any call. Make sure you can hear the DX and fall into his rhythm. Always double check that you have the DX call correct. Never call blind. Throw in your full call once and practice the timing of it. Now if you just casually enter a contest, maybe you just want to get on the last hour. You will be fresh meat. You will be in great demand and can have real fun for an hour. Save some DX perhaps until later when their pileups have eased. Late at night, the early morning hours, last evening. Now, there are written and unwritten rules. Never do skeds via phones, SMS, and don't do skeds in advance. No self-spotting. You can be disqualified in some contests for that. Work everyone, no cheerleading for friends or clubs. Sitting down in front of a radio for 48 hours is not really a very healthy practice, is it? Eat and drink wisely. Rest wisely. Stand up and move about or stretch every hour or so. Maybe go for a quick walk outside to get some fresh air. Go as long as it's fun and feels good. But it seems like, for me at least, at some stage, it feels like more, it would be more fun to take a nap. Keep some post-it notes handy during the contest and jot down ideas for improvements for next time. Log corrections, perhaps. Things to do before next. Things to check out. And sooner or later, it's just a few minutes left. An encouraging glance at your target with a smile and then a final spurt. Ding dong, time is up. It's all over. Another satisfied glance at your target file. You're probably still somewhat high on adrenaline, so why not upload your log immediately? But before that, check your notes and do any edits in the log you fumbled on the go. Don't try to finesse your log. Likely, that's likely to generate more errors than you correct. But do check that the details are right. Category, power, assisted or unassisted. Typically, you can then check that your log is received and perhaps see a list of all claimed scores. You upload the log in Cabrillo format. I'm also used to see that in California, they are so into contesting that they have named streets after the log format. After that, it is time to prepare for the next contest, but I suspect you probably will crash out before you are ready for that. Because your ears were still ringing with the sound of contest. As you were falling asleep, you didn't notice the lonely voice of your spouse singing. In due course, you will see the results of the contest posted. You might receive your UBN report from the adjudicator. This is your opportunity to think about how you can improve your accuracy next time. 
and now it's really about time to plan for the next one. You review your notes from the contest. You compare your RBN spots with a peer in the same area doing the same category. Can you squeeze in some more or better antennas on some band? Can you reduce, reduce the receive noise on the low bands? Perhaps you want to prepare for your next for your first steps towards SR2R. Get an SR2R controller and I can guarantee you will spend many long dark winter evenings trying to get to grips with the configuration and play with all the neat buttons and knobs. Okay, it's time to uh, wrap up. Let's finish with a quick glimpse into the future. Real-time logging and scoring, immediate preliminary results. We'll have that soon, I hope. More digital modes, better and more fun, less mechanical. The radio will be an STR black box with excellent performance and very affordable. The user interface would be could be a panel with knobs or a tablet, touch screen or both. Your preference. I hope that the software folks will develop multi-channel STRs for us. Where we could get software beam forming both for receive and transmit. The LDMOS amplifiers will be standard, linearized, driven to full power with a 5 or 10 watt SDR. The antennas will remain a challenge, I hope, with more science and less marketing hype and magic. No science fiction in this at all. It's just a matter of applying what we already have, what is already there. The operator skills will still make the difference in the future. We are privileged with a very special and exciting hobby. The technology we play with continues to change, and we must welcome that change and innovation. When we learn about ionospheric propagation, we learn about a small aspect of the broader scientific issue about Sun-Earth interaction in climate and the future of Earth, be it the next hundred years or the next billion years. Now, without change, our hobby dies with us. Aversion to change has killed corporations. And on a grand scale, read history and we will learn how aversion to change and a desire to put the clock back has killed civilizations. So let's hope we can put this extraordinary COVID situation behind us and get together in person at next year's RSGB convention. Or at our annual December post CQ Worldwide dinner in Southeast England, perhaps also at the Friedrichshafen Ham Radio Gathering and at the contest suite at Crown Plaza during the Dayton Hamvention. Not much bees hanging out with the other contest nerds. A rowdy crowd if there ever was one. that Ward Silver and Zero AX and his Purious Emission Span are at least as good contesters as they are singers. From perhaps seven years old to 77, I for one have enjoyed the same fascination, the same enthusiasm for the HF radio. And from Titanic and then that fishing vessel that was lost, we have improved maritime safety. But even today, with all navigation and communication technology at their disposal, the mariner's safety in the end depend on the human factor and human skills. And the same goes for our hobby in a similar way. From Sprock transmitters a long time ago to SDRs and the digital modes today, the human factor, the human skills still make the difference. And now a final test. What do you see here? The comet Neowise or the rotating tower at EI7M? So, 73, have fun, go contesting, hand out some points in the Scandinavian SSB contest that will be in full swing when this virtual convention finishes. Up, 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 hey, hey, stop, don't run away, I forgot to tell you. We beat them. W3LPL, K3LR, we beat them. Look at that. But it looks like we ended up lost in Africa.
Well, congratulations, Olaf. And uh, wow, well, there's a lot in that <laughs> in that uh, in that video. And uh, we've got one or two uh, points to, uh, to to put to you. Um, Gary Champion, uh, no call sign with this one, says uh, he wants to thank you actually uh, because he says Voa Cap uh, was something new to him. Uh, so thank you for letting him know about it. That's the VOA in that is Voice of America, isn't it? It was something to do with the broadcast station. Yes, it was a uh, forecasting scheme developed. You know, in the old days, it was really the broadcasters that financed, well, the broadcasters and military that financed much of the studies of uh, shortwave propagation. So VOA there comes from Voice of America. Yes, they used that to, uh, to plan their shortwave broadcast around the world. Okay, and still a few comments coming in. Rod, VA3ON, uh, says, fantastic, uh, wonderful talk. Dave, G4OTV, excellent. Is there anywhere that the music Olaf used can be downloaded? <laughs> I, yes, there is actually. I think they are selling a CD. I think it's available on the web, Amazon and so forth. I will have, uh, by the way, I, have a set, I, I did prepare a set of links. I know I went fast, so I have links to some of that I talked about. And if you go to golfstereocharliekillervictory.com slash rsgb2000, I think there are links also to the music. Okay. Now, we have a question from Rob, who's doing the technicals for me down in Cambridge, actually. And he said, uh, in the um, vertical versus dipole comparison that you showed us, was the average ground a vertical with radials on the ground or elevated? And does it make a difference if you go to elevated radials in that situation? Well, I don't. I, I wouldn't try to put in elevated radials in uh, my uh, suburban garden. Actually, it makes it very messy. I would put uh, radials on the ground. Look, it, 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 verticals is tricky because there are several grounds around the vertical. You have the you have the ground under the uh, vertical, and uh, if you don't put in radials, depending on the quality of that ground you get some losses there. But those losses are in the order of a few decibels. The real big issue for the performance of vertical is actually the ground further out, where the uh, long distance radiation, where the elevation pattern is built up. So the, the, the quality of the ground, you know, many, many wavelengths out from the vertical matter. And you can't do anything about, the, about that. You cannot put radials that far out. So the radials are just to improve the efficiency so you don't use uh, you don't heat the ground under the aisle okay interesting uh, uh, john harrison said he'd love to see your suburban antenna farm in his 43 foot garden but uh, we have to do what we uh, what we can do don't we uh, Olaf? that's the thing with uh, uh, you know, you're it. worse off than me i have a few more feet but not many okay now um what oh another question from rob uh, how much benefit do you get from listening in diversity from different polarization antennas on, on receive? It's uh, not possible to stay. I mean, th th those things you can only try out. You know, when you listen, in particular on the low bands, it, it, it's always useful to be able to listen on different antennas because you are interested in the signal to noise ratio. It's not necessarily so that you transmit antenna on the low bands is better. Uh, Another way, if you have a receiver like a K3, where you can listen to uh, diversity, that may also help, but not always. But the point, the point I make is that this is where experimenting, trying, trying different things may work out. On one signal, by the way, one antenna may be better. On another, another antenna. Okay, I think uh, Bill uh, GM4UBJ is extolling the virtues of QRP. Actually. Uh, Maybe that's something you haven't tried, uh, Olaf. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I think QRP is fun. You you get more satisfaction out of doing. I mean, if you run one of these big contest stations, which I have done, it, it's good fun. But the satisfaction, you know, of being able to do things with simple wires, low power, and QRP, yeah, I can get I get that. Okay, now. <clears throat> You're probably expecting this uh, this sort of question. What's your message to those who every weekend they're on the Facebook group saying, can I can't find a frequency because there's yet another contest? What do you say to people when that gets thrown at you? Well, there's a surprising amount of contests right now. I mean, there are probably more 
I mean, on average, there are more contests than there are days in the year. And I can see that, uh, you know, well, okay, how should I put it? If you take the big contest, it's a couple of weekends per year. Fine, you have to live with it. Thousands and 10,000 people perhaps get on the air. And that's fantastic. Our bands should be used. Most of the time, during the days, during the weeks, the bands are pretty quiet. People go to work, retire people do other things. We are chatting on uh, WhatsApp or whatever instead of getting on the air. So uh, I think you have to live with the fact that few contests perhaps may sound overwhelming, but I think in the majority of cases, fairly, there are frequencies available. You have the walk bands, there may be a CW contest and you can go on SSB, live with it. Do you have anything to say to them that might convert them to the, to the contest fold? Well, you know, we all have sort of different mindset, different interests, you know, some of us want to uh, chat uh, generally and don't like all the noise and mess and the speed and haste of a contest. That's fine. I mean, uh, that's the beauty of this hobby, isn't it? You know, all these different things we can do. Hmm. do have you got a suggestion for a, for a contest that might be good for someone wanting to dip their toe into contesting? Well, start with the RSGB or the local contest. They are in the evening, an hour, hour and a half, and they are friendly. It's fast over. But otherwise, or, or now, well, or if you want to do a regional contest like the REF contest, the WAG, the Scandinavian Activity Contest, they are, they, they are sort of moderate pace and uh, they're also friendly and fun. Now, you mentioned in, in your talk one of the tools that uh, we could use for checking on activity is, is um, or are band maps. Could you explain what you mean by a band map and where you might find one? Well, well a band map is, let's say, uh, well, most contest loggers, they have a band map. That's like the scale on your uh, receiver. It's sort of a frequency, is hmm, a ruler with the frequencies, and against those frequencies, you, you sort of put in the, the, the call that is occupying a particular frequency. You get that if you are, are assisted in the contest, you get those calls from the cluster from RBN. But if you are non unassisted, you do it yourself. You scan the band, you, you tune uh, across the band, and as you fill in the call in the logger, you either work the guy, and then he ends up as worked in the band map, or you, you just uh, have worked him before, and you still enter him in, in, in the band map, so you know who it is, and you can then roll over the band much quicker. Yeah, I use one on HRD. Uh, uh, Rod, VA3ON's been back on. He says, how much station automation do you uh, implement, such as switching and filters and things like that? You know, I even, I, I've done some traveling alone around the world and done contesting, and I uh, want to have it automated. I want to be able to switch very fast. So when I type in, if I go from one, let's say I'm 40 and I want to go to 14025, I type in 14025 on the logging uh, in, in my logger and uh, the antenna switch automatically, the amplifier switches automatically if I have one. And I don't have to worry about twisting knobs and doing the wrong thing. You know, if you are in a contest and you do it seriously, you do get tired in the end and you can make mistakes. You save time, but the best thing, the most important thing is, I think, the reliability, the simplicity. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a slide you put up of M6T. Are, are you associated with a, with a superstation like M6T? No, I know the guys. I admire them. That's uh, hard work, must be hard work, putting up all those uh, powers uh, for a contest. Do you think you have They're to be a that, superstation? Well, Sorry, do you think you have to be a superstation to, to actually do well or, or win? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I've been doing okay from my rear garden, maybe by wet strings. I think it's, it's a matter of how you enjoy. I mean, okay, there are some guys that are super competitive and they must win. And they use their elbows and they behave badly, you name it. I think it should also be have to win. But the satisfaction when you sort of do better every time, when you learn new things, is uh, rewarding. 
uh, on the odd occasion I go in a contest, the thing that lets me down is typing into the uh, into the um, into the into the logger. Um, I, I, well, you, you were saying that you use a it looked like a very flashy keyboard there with lots of macros, uh, lots of macros on it. Is, uh, is that pretty important for you to use something like that? Well, <clears throat> again, uh, well, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm a poor typist. Uh, I like a good keyboard, and and these are the gamers. You know, the gamers that use these kind of keyboards. I have the old cherry keys that we used back uh, 40, 50 years ago. Now, um, the macros are important because you don't want to sit. You know, if you do telegraphy, you don't want to sit with a paddle or send all the repetitive stuff over and over again. So you just press the key and the computer does it for you. And if you do SSP, you can record CQs, uh, your messages and so forth in a voice key. Yeah? So <clears throat> my voice wouldn't last very long in the contest, but I can use the voice key and it helps for me. And, and all that is on macros. And I, yeah, I can remember. I can remember why I was going to ask that question, actually, because you were talking about at the end of the contest, go through your log and check for any any mistakes. Do do you, as an experienced contester, still make uh, still make mistakes that have to be corrected? Oh, everyone does. Um, you, 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 that, that some mistakes can almost not be avoided, but you also learn where they are, so you get a little bit more careful. They also do a lot of contesting. You know, they begin to recognize the call signs. If you hear M6, you probably think, oh, it must be M6T or, uh, or yeah. 7M. Oh, that is EI7M. So you know what you should log. Uh, you, after a contest, I have to admit that after a contest, I probably had enough of it. So the idea of sitting there and fiddling with a log and uh, listening to recording and checking, you know, no, that's not on. I want to send in the log and get on with life. Absolutely. Now, um, just before we go, just a couple of comments to you from Masahiro Kitagawa, who is JH3PRR, and I think he is actually in Japan because he's, he's also got other call signs. He says, Olaf, great presentation. I enjoyed it. See you in the contests. And uh, Anthony Turnbull, G4CUS, says, thank you, Olaf, for an interesting presentation from an occasional non-serious contester. So there you are. Something for everybody in your talk, uh, Olaf. Thank you very much. Thanks for... Uh, for joining well, thank us. You. you were five and nine zero zero one in India Oscar nine two golf mic if that helps. Thank you.